Bharvi, please uh, unmute from your side. Sorry. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this fourth day, fifth day, sorry, of Pautiki Yatra, a travel for scientific Indian minds. Today, we have a very amazing speaker with us and our own alumnus of our department, Dr. Sudhendra Rai Prolsar from UJC BA CSR, Mumbai. Before that, we have a very special guest from our university, and for to invite them, I would like to and call upon Dr. Nikesh Shah, sir, to introduce our today's guest. Welcome, sir. Everyone in Bhautti Kyatra, fifth day. Uh, first of all, I welcome uh, our alumnus, Dr. Sudhendra Raiprol. Uh, and today, uh, we have special guest from our university, Dr. Bhavin Bhai Kothari. He is a senior most syndicate member of our university, uh, my profession is MS surgeon and uh, he is also uh, the senior member of Medical Council of India, of Government of India. And uh, Dr. Pawin Pai is uh, in many committees of Government of India in medical science. So he is a very uh, potential and uh, very active uh, syndicate member and uh, in the development of Saurash mm -hmm. University, he is taking keen interest. So I welcome uh, Dr. Bhavin Bhai Kothari on behalf of Bhautiki Yatra Organizing Committee and uh, Saurash University and DST. Which cost? Please, uh, Bhavin Bhai. Good morning, everyone. I am glad that the team uh, Bhautiki Yatra has arranged a nine days webinar, which is a most demanded uh, at present time. And uh, I, I can see a qualitative webinar, which started with uh, Padmasri Verma sir. And today we have a eminent speaker, Dr. Sudhinder Repol, who is alumni of the Saurash University. I'm glad I, I, I'm part of it. Since my beginning of a uh, syndicate membership and senate membership of Soda University, I am very much specially affiliated to the physics department. And now on this web, uh, uh, on this on this 25th May, be before the Dr. Sudhinder Repol's uh, uh, academic delightful lecture, I welcome you all, and I I hope you all. Enjoy it, and not only enjoy it, it will be helpful to you academically. I wish all grand success to this Dr. Bautiki Yatra, Twill 29. I welcome Amir by Joshi sir, Bharat by Kataria, and all other dignitaries. And I appreciate those who have worked hard uh, for this um, making success, uh, making success Bautiki Yatra. And I welcome again Dr. Sudhinder Repol sir, very good morning and all the best and I uh, wish great success to this today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhavin, sir, for your kind blessings and always uh, support throughout this webinar and all time. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Moving towards the lecture part, uh, before that, I would uh, to introduce our today's speaker, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Bharvi Hirpura, a PhD scholar in our Department of Physics, to please introduce our today's speaker. Welcome, Ms. Bharvi. Good morning, everyone. Wish you a very cheerful and enlightening day. Uh, I'm glad here today to introduce Dr. Sudhinder Raiparol, a thoroughgoing, thoroughgoing and conscientious scientist F at, uh, science, at the UGCDA Consortium for Scientific Research, Mumbai Center. Uh, 
he has been working there since december 2006 till now uh, he's got a post doctoral experience of 4 years is also a research P, uh, registered phd guide at davv indore and uh, sppu that is savitri bai phule pune university at pune he has completed his phd in, uh, phd on the, on the investigations on structural and transport properties of mixed oxide systems he has got a wide research experience uh, as he is also visiting fellow at tifr mumbai uh, so has he has been uh, for for three years over there also he was uh, uh, there at alexander von humboldt research fellow institute for as a res- visiting uh, research fellow uh, he has got a research experience there he has got total publications a huge number that is a 262 research publications uh, out of which 52 are international and national conferences and book chapters and others in peer reviewed journals and other conference proceedings he has got also a large number of citations that is oral citations being 2106 with hx24 and iten index 68 He is also a, a recipient of many awards and fellowships, like Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship 2005-06 by Alexander von Humboldt uh, Humboldt Stiftung Germany. Uh, also, a recipient, a recipient of NS Murthy Memorial Award in Physics for Young Scientist 2010, awarded by Indian Physics Association, and also the Young Achievers Award for the year 2011 by the Department of Atomic Energy (SSPS). Academically, also he's been the editorial board member of the Open Conference Proceedings Journal, and he's also a life, uh, also being a life member of the Material Research Society of India, Neutron Scattering Society of India, and the Indian Physics Association. Over and above this, he's also a reviewer for the following journals and publications: that is, American Physical Society, Physics Review Letters. journals like uh, nature publishing group scientific reports uh, iop iop journal of physics and you know, condensed matter from elsewhere publication journal of magnetism and Man- magnetic materials physica b solid state communication mscb apd from taylor and francis Physio- philosophical magazines etc american chemical society in organic and chemical uh, in organic chemistry and chemical materials uh, in indian Ke- academy of sciences uh, and many more such renowned journals today we are going to enli- he is going to en- we are going to uh, get enriched ourselves and he will enlighten us on the sort topic understanding structure and magnetism using neutron powder diffraction so kindly enlighten us with your knowledge sir So, can I start? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Bharavi. Thanks, Chintan, for uh, introducing me to this webinar. At the outset, I would like to thank all the organizers for invite for arranging this Pothiki Yatra, and also inviting me to be part of this. And uh, as uh, Bharavi has already spoken about my work at the Bombay Center, we basically work on neutron diffraction, which which is one of our mandates to. Uh, utilize these facilities for the benefit of the university researchers and we allow and we facilitate the use of the neutron reactor at vrc uh, thrower reactor and we have uh, set up one powder diffractometer at the thrower and in addition to that we have certain uh, certain uh, physical property measurement systems also in our center so the basic research f- focus for us is, has always been the structural property correlations and keeping that in mind uh, the i have chosen this topic of understanding structure and magnetism by using neutron powder diffraction and by doing that uh, my plan of this presentation is to cover some of these topics relating to the use of diffractions for the for the study of prop materials so the basic question which comes to our mind is why diffraction is needed when you are looking at the physical properties so the my effort to introduce the seminar will be to uh, to give you a flavor of how neutrons can be useful in studying the structure property correlations and in during this yatra for today's yatra i will try to tell what information we can extract from or, or how we can analyze our neutron diffraction data and uh, i will also give you a brief idea of how our powder diffractometer works and using some examples from our, our own work i will try to give you a, a brief flavor of how the physical properties are better explained when you have neutron diffraction data on your side okay 
Okay, so let me start by saying that when we say that diffraction, I'm not going to the details of elementary of diffraction. I, I know we all understand that. But when we talk about diffraction, why it is important to look into diffraction uh, when, we are, uh, when we want to study the physical properties. So the example which comes to my mind is that of these two allotropes of carbon, the well-known uh, allotropes of diamond and graphite. Diamond, as we know, is the hardest known substance with a relatively high density, whereas graphite is soft and easy to touch and very malleable also. From, uh, the refractive index for diamond is very high, whereas the graphite is opaque. And like that, there are differences in their physical properties also. The, the diamond occurs in octahedral crystals, whereas graphite uh, has a hexagonal structure. Crystals. So if you look into the, the uh, actual structure of the diamond and graphite, you can find that in case of uh, diamond, carbon atom is linked to its neighboring four carbon atoms via a single covalent bond, which forms this three-dimensional network, which gives it the stability and hardness. Whereas in the case of, uh, whereas in the case of carbon, uh, graphite, the carbon atoms are arranged in four in flat parallel layers as regular hexagons, where each carbon uh, in these layers are bonded to next three uh, uh, via these covalent bonds. And each layer is connected by this weak mantle of our forces. So it is easy to, to slice them along these layers, okay, which makes them very soft. So what we understand, or the moral of the story so far is that the difference in the physical properties can be attributed to where the carbon atoms are arranged, that is the structure of their, uh, the respective uh, allotropes, which makes the differences in the physical properties also. So the, the diffraction, why it is important is because the knowledge of the crystal structure helps in understanding the physical properties. If the sample is magnetic or it is in magnetic ordered state, you can obtain the information of the magnetic uh, structure from neutron diffraction data. And by understanding this relation between structure and physical properties, you can actually tailor materials for a particular characteristics. What if, what I mean by that, I would like to give you an example of this multiferric fluoroscite that is lead iron niobate and lead iron tungsten. Lead, lead iron niobate, for example, has an antiferromagnetic ordering temperature of at 130 Kelvin and a Curie, ferroelectric Curie temperature at 350 Kelvin. On the uh, lead iron niobate, uh, tungsten, on the other hand, has an antiferromagnetic ordering temperature at 380 Kelvin and has a TC or Curie temperature at 150 Kelvin. So if you see, they are actually uh, opposite to each other. So if you want a a uh, sample which has which should have an ordering temperature or room temperature and a curie temperature also in the vicinity. And so what you do is that you make a solid solution of that. Okay. And this is one from one of the thesis which was done on our uh, instrument in our center. And you can see that at one of the concentrations you have a TC which is TN which is close to the room temperature and also the TC which is in the comparable uh, uh, comparable range. So if you know the structural properties, you see that at, at this concentration, there is a crossover from monoclinic phase to the cubic phase, or vice versa, which way you look, look at it, okay. So what it means is that if you understand the, the physical properties, you can understand the crystal structure, and you, by, you, and by the knowledge of these two, you can actually devise your um, compounds. You can tailor the materials for specific purposes. Okay. Now, what are the diffraction probes which are available to carry out the diffraction experiments to look at the structure? We have electron diffraction, we can have X-ray diffraction, we can have neutron diffraction. The electron diffraction, the electrons interact with the outermost electrons in the sample by electrostatic interaction. And the advantage of electron diffraction is that you can look into the structures and thin sections of materials which are close to the material surface. It helps in studying this, uh, the short range order in amorphous solids, for example. But there are certain disadvantages also, like the electron beam starts interacting with the matter. It cannot penetrate too deep into the system. And to do electron diffraction, you need very high vacuum. So there's, the experimental uh, conditions are very stringent. And there's a problem with the electron diffraction that it is limited by the phase problem. The second probe which is widely used is the X-ray diffraction. The X-rays interact with the matter through this electromagnetic interaction. And because of that, it gets scattered. The advantages of X-rays is that there are laboratory sources which are readily available. There are very good commission instruments, so you can do X-ray diffraction very routinely and very easily. 
It is useful uh, for identification, of, uh, for phase identification and calculating unit cell parameters because X-rays have very good resolution compared to neutrons. But the problem with X-rays is that the scattering of X-rays depends on the atomic number. Okay, so what it means is that you cannot identify lateral elements in the presence of heavier atoms. So that is one of the constraints with X-rays. Now comes the neutron diffraction. So neutron diffraction, as uh, in, in the neutrons can interact with the nucleus of your atom or of your material and get scattered because of this nuclear interaction. The advantage here is that it can identify lighter elements in the presence of the heavier ones because the nuclear scattering doesn't depend upon the atomic number, but depends on the nuclear energy levels. If you're working with, uh, uh, say, ionic solids where you have to identify the cationic distribution, it's very convenient to do that in the case of nuclear diffraction. Uh, it also helps in identifying the oxygen stoichiometry because if you have anions and cations, the oxygen being one of the cations can be easily identified. And you can also identify the thermal parameters. You can also do the phase quantification. Another part of the neutron diffraction is that the neutrons have magnetic moment. It has, so the, the magnetic moment or the spin of the neutron can interact with the unpaired electron in the sample by the dipole dipole interaction and get scattered. That is called magnetic scattering. And it becomes an, in, makes it neutrons an excellent tool for studying both crystallographic structure and the magnetic structure. And by, from the magnetic structure analysis, you can actually identify commensurate and commensurate structures. But that disadvantage of neutrons is that not all elements are neutron scatterers. There are neutron absorbers also. And of course, neutrons are not easily available. They are quite expensive to do that. But if you consider this as a compare the form factor dependence for X-rays and neutrons, the magnetic neutron part, you can see that the X-rays and neutron, the magnetic interaction, because they both interact with the electrons in the sample, the form form dependence is almost identical, which means that and, and in case of neutron magnetic scattering, the, the fall is very rapid compared to the X-rays. But it means that there's only a certain range of two theta in which you can expect magnetic back peaks. So that is an advantage of having, of using neutron diffraction actually. Now, depending upon the kinetic energy of neutrons, neutrons are classified in a different varieties, like cold neutrons, thermal neutrons, slow neutrons, fast neutrons, and ultra fast neutrons. So what we require for neutrons, uh, for neutron diffraction is the thermal neutrons with an energy of about 25 mm. So what it means is that if you can convert it into, in terms of wavelength or energies, you will find that this, the wavelength which you get from thermal neutrons is of the order of one to five angstroms, which is actually ideal for the diffraction purposes. So that is why when we do neutron diffraction, we are always all talking about thermal neutrons. So, as you know, neutrons, they can behave as a particle, they have they behave as a wave, and both of these characteristics makes it a wonderful tool for neutron diffraction. As a particle, it has a spin, it has a magnetic moment, and as a wave, it can, it has, it can cause diffraction and interference patterns, it has measurable wavelength and a measurable scattering error, so which makes it an ideal tool for probing the matter. So some neutron properties which we can just enlist is that being a charge particles, Neutrons can penetrate deep into the matter, so you can get information from, at the microscope with uh, The atomic scattering amplitude for neutrons are not linked to the number of electrons. It is not Z-dependent like in the case of X-rays, which makes that the magnitude of interaction is different for different isotopes. So it is different, easy to identify different elements in a particular sample. It possesses a magnetic moment, so it makes interacts with the elect unpaired electrons, which makes it an ideal tool for study the magnetic structures. And because of the energy and wavelength of thermal neutrons are comparable to the thermal energy and spacing of atomic solids, it make makes it a natural method for studying the scattering for phonons and magnons. You can do density of states if you do in elastic scattering machines. And it provides complementary information to X-ray and light scattering experiments. So just coming to the basic theory, when we talk about the diffraction experiment, so you can consider that a new neutron comes with an incident energy of EI as an incident wave vector of EI. When it interacts with the sample, and gets scattered, it ends up with an energy of EF, that is the energy after the, of the scattered neutron and a wave vector, scattered wave vector. So in, in, the, in the real, in, 
in the imaginary in the reciprocal space, we will consider a scattering triangle. Okay. So in case of then in in case of this scattering event, the energy transferred by the sample to the sample from the neutrons can be given by this equation. When when we talk about diffraction, we are talking about the elastic scattering, which means that E i is equals to E f. The incident energy and the scattered energy of the neutrons are same. So therefore, in this case, the scattering wave vector can be written by this equation, which is basically the Bragg's law in the reciprocal space. So our scattering wave vector is four pi sine theta by lambda, and when and the the constructive interference, if we say in terms of light scattering experiments, uh, can be understood by the, in terms of neutrons by this condition. So if this condition is satisfied, we get a diffraction. Now the scat neutron scattering is or nuclear scattering of neutrons is isotropic, which means that the neutrons scatter isotropically in all directions. So if you look at the scattering event from the detector side, the angle subtended by this is called the solid angle and is given by this angle, right? So in, in that case, the instant neutron flux, which can be uh, measured by the detector is given by this and the D sigma by P omega. Okay. And this is where the D sigma by D omega is scattered cross section. The, intense, the, the scattered intensity in the neutron diffraction is given by this equation, where this depends upon the incident beam intensity, the number of atoms in the crystal structure, and the structure factor. The structure factor, which has information about the scattering length of the neutron for that particular atom, and also the atomic position, or number of, the, the position of atoms and number of atoms in the units. So, and this scattering cross section, which is given by sigma, is, uh, represents the flux of scattered neutrons per instant flux, number of neutrons getting scattered after the sample, which depends upon the scattering length of the sample. So this, this scattering length is complex quantity, and it has a real part and imaginary part, and the imaginary part is considered as the neutron absorption part. For most of the elements, the absorption cross section is less than the, uh, the scattering cross section, Therefore, we consider only the real part, that is the scattering part. But there are certain exceptions. There are certain elements like cadmium, gadolinium, boron, samarium, and so on, which, for which the absorption cross-section is very high. And because of which then it acts as neutron absorbers. It has an advantage for us because we can use these elements as neutron shielding materials. So now we have, a, if you consider the scattering cross-section, you have a scattering cross-section and you have an absorption cross-section. In some cases, the B is a positive quantity, but there can be negative B values also, which has a physical prevalence because it indicates a phase shift on scattering that differs by 180 degree. It's an opposite phase with respect to the positive B values. We will see one example where we have a negative scattering length also. So which will tell us how important it is in terms of diffraction. Now, in a, in a particular sample, we have more than one species of atom. So, for example, if I'm working with lanthanum manganese, lanthanum manganese, and oxygen, and all three will scatter neutrons depending on its scattering length. So, in those cases, the scattering cross section can be modified and, and can be written like this, which means that it has one coherent part, it's coherent scattering, which, and, which comprises of all these scattering coming from the coherent part of the elements. And some elements, they scatter incoherently. And it can so also be part of your total scattering cross section. So the interference effects can arise from the coherent scattering, which means that if you take the analogy of light, the constructive interference gives rise to diffraction patterns. So in this case, the coherent scattering will give rise to diffraction effects, black mix. Now, this is a comparison for scattering length as with, with respect to the uh, for, for neutrons with respect to the X-ray form factors. So uh, just to give you a brief example, so you can see the scattering uh, lengths for copper and zinc. If you look at the periodic table, they are one electron apart. But if you look at the X-ray form factor for uh, copper and zinc, they're almost identical. So the difference is about 4%. But in case of neutrons, the difference between uh, of scattering length between cobalt and copper and zinc is about 36%, which means that neutrons will scatter both copper and zinc, it will scatter copper more than zinc. So if you do the structural analysis for a compound containing copper and zinc, you will be able to identify both copper and zinc. So you, can, you will be able to identify the, the occupancies or the 
amount of copper and zinc present in your sample more precisely than in case of X-rays. Another, another example which I can give you is, of, is about lead and oxygen. In this case also, you can see that uh, the, the neutron scattering length for lead and oxygen, they are of the same order. Of course, it is lead is more scattering than oxygen, but they also scatter. But if you compare with the, of the X-ray form factor, you can see that the lead dominates the scattering compared to oxygen. So when you do the analysis with X-rays, it is very likely, unlikely that will identify oxygen in the presence of lead. But then in case of neutrons, you can be able to easily identify. So these are the advantages of using neutrons over the X-rays. Okay. So the wave scattered for a particular atom, for a particular atoms like lead in, in lead oxide can be written for lead and oxygen separately. And to get the resultant wave factor, you have to add both of them, you have to consider the both which will give you the structure factor. The intensity which we measure is basically proportional to this structure factor. We'll come back to this equation in a short one from now. Now, when we do the diffraction pattern, I assume that you have seen a diffraction pattern, how it looks like. So this is basically what we measure. We measure intensity as a function of the scattering angle. This is a typical X-ray diffraction pattern. So what do we have in it? What information is buried here is that you have basically backgrounds and you have reflections. The background can be because of the sample. The samples can, uh, from the sample, what I mean, can be because of the Compton scattering or diffuse scattering. So if you use a proper bottling of, for local structure or, or amorphous fraction or lattice dynamics, you can actually get the information from this background also. Another source for backgrounds can be from the sample holder itself or from the air scattering and so on. The other part of the diffraction pattern is the reflections, which are this sharp drag waves, which you see here. The information which you can get from these reflections are, are the position, from the position, from the intensity, and from the profile shape or the shape of the uh, peaks. This, if the peaks are very sharp, it can be it just because of the crystallinity. If the peaks become broader and broader, it can be because of the sample broadening. So if you can model that peak broadly, you can get information of the micro strain and domain size. If you look at the intensity, and if you, that intensity is, can tell you about the crystal structure, basically the atomic positions, temperature factor, occupancies, and so on. The position can tell you about the lattice parameters, the space group. If you can model your structure, you can get the micro strain from the, from the qualitative phase analysis. So in all, there's a lot of information is buried inside a powder diffraction pattern. So if you can model your powder diffraction pattern, you can simply, you can generate a lot of information from, you can ex extract a lot of information from this powder diffraction pattern. So the next step is that how to record the diffraction data? How do you measure the diffraction patterns? So what, what we generally do, uh, there are different geometries. One is called the bragg bernardo geometry, which is basically the reflectance geometry. What I mean is that you have an X-ray source here, you have a sample and you have a detector. Source the, the excess which falls in the sample gets reflected and is picked up by this detector which moves in this two theta range. So what you measure is the intensity falling on the sample recorded by the by the detector in, in, as a function of this two theta. The another this is this is a geometry we would have seen in X-ray diffractometer. This is the actual diffractometer uh, picture where you have a source here, excess generator here, you have a sample position here. This is the detector. The sample, the, the X-rays falls on the samples, get, by, get reflected, and is picked up by this detector. Another part of the, the, another type of geometry which is used for diffraction is called the Debye-Shiller geometry, or you can call it a transmission mode geometry, which means that the, the radiation passes through the samples, gets scattered in all the direction, and is recorded by this detector. Here also, what we are measuring is the relative is the intensity as a function of the scattering angle. Where you find this, this is basically you find in a neutron powder diffractometer. The neutron beams falls onto the samples, get scattered in all direction, and this this is recorded by the detectors which are housed here. Okay. Now we have to choose a radiation. What type of radiation you want to use for your measurements? So this is one example I would like to show you. This is for this compound called calcium cobalt magnesium oxide. And if you re recall from periodic table, this cobalt and magnesium are also neighboring elements. 
So what it means is that when you see the diffraction pattern for X rays and neutrons, with identical wavelengths, we can see that there's difference in this pattern. So what is the source for this difference? One of them is the that in case of X-ray, you have an X-ray form factor which comes into picture, whereas in case of neutrons, you have a scattering length. Again, if you see cobalt and manganese being, ident being neighboring elements, their scattering factor is the same. What it means is that when you want to look for cobalt and manganese composition, or you want to see how much cobalt and manganese is there, it is very difficult to identify between cobalt and manganese. They may look similar in terms of X-ray diffraction. But if you look at the uh, cobalt manganese scattering lens, you can see that for cobalt, it is positive P values, where, where, whereas in the case of manganese, it is negative. There's a clear contrast between cobalt and manganese, and you can easily identify how much cobalt and manganese is there. So if you're working with, particularly in this system, if you're working with the cobalt manganese ratio, it is easy to distinguish them according to your, the neutron scattering lens. So, but it doesn't make a difference if we are trying to solve the structure because the same model, structural model, can fit both the X-ray and the neutron diffraction data. So it is for you to decide which type of radiation you want to use depending upon the purpose of your experiment. Now, where are, what are the neutron sources which you have? All the neutrons are produced. For neutrons that, which are used for diffraction experiments are usually from either from the reactor source, which employs this fission reaction, which we all know have, would have studied in our MSc classes, is that you have a neutron, which fast neutron, uh, energetic neutron falling upon a, a nuclei, usually the uranium nucleus, splits into two parts, and that process releases for neutrons. As long as this chain reaction goes on, you will have a continuous supply of neutrons. So this fission reaction or the reactor type sources are called continuous wave neutrons, and it is a uh, it is also used for diffraction, but obviously, since it, it is re, uh, uh, reactive based, you have to be very careful with the radiation effects. Another source which is relatively safer compared to neutron reactors are the spallation sources, in which a, prime, a proton, for example, is uh, energized using a synchrotron ring, and this energized, highly energetic proton is impinged upon a heavy metal target and which knocks out the neutrons. And this thing continues. And as depending on the pulse of neutron which comes, you get a pulse of neutrons as in the, in the output. So the, this is spallation source, which is called the pulse source also. So we have a continuous source, we have a spallation source. But for spallation source, you need to have a reactor. You need to have a, a, a synchrotron to get these highly charged protons or charged particles. Now, once neutrons are produced, are diffracted, you need detectors to detect them. Neutron being a charge, less particles. So it is a bit tricky to de use detectors for that. So there are something called professional gas detectors, which, are, which works on this proportionality principle. And these are used as position sensitive detectors. So one, the most efficient ones or the most popular ones are the helium-3, uh, which is isotope of helium helium-3 uh, gas filled detectors in which the incoming neutron interacts with this helium gas molecule, gives out a proton and a tissue with some energies. The proton is taken up by the anode which is detected. For each neutron, it generates one proton and that is how the neutrons and neutron diffractions are, patterns are recorded. There are some uh, uh, boron trifluoride detectors also available which is less efficient than helium but they also are used as position sensitive detectors. The disadvantage of BF3 detectors is that it's highly toxic gas, so its handling is quite difficult. But the disadvantage which helium-3 is that it is very expensive. It is not easily available. But compared to cost and all, helium detectors, uh, the detectors are more efficient and popular used. There are some scintillation detectors like uh, helium-6 detectors. You can have a uh, complex of gadolinium oxide and gadolinium sulfide, which also works as detectors. But of course, the detection efficiency is less compared with the helium-3 detectors. So what we use generally is the helium-3 detectors for the neutron diffraction detectors. Now comes the question, where can we do these neutron experiments? Uh, there are many sources available all over the world. What you see in yellow is the reactor-based sources. 
what you see in red are the synchrotron based or spallation sources for neutron reactors. In India, also, we have two research reactors one was Cyrus and one is Thuva. Cyrus is right now decommissioned, so it is no longer in operation. So, the, all the neutron beam research activities are carried out through our reactor. So, in Dhruva, all the react neutron beam facilities are called, are under this national facility for neutron beam research. And there are plenty of research ex experiments which are possible using neutron beam. If you go to the reactor hall, I think some of you might have visited already, you can see that there are some different neutron scattering experiments which are possible, instruments which are available, like triple axis spectrometer, you have polarized action analysis spectrometer, single crystal, you have uh, order diffractometers, you have high Q diffractometer, you have uh, what's called filter detected spectrometer, which is upgraded to a triple axis spectrometer now, time of flight measurements. You have quasi axis spectrometer also. And if you see this image uh, here, this is a tunnel which is taking the reactors from, which is taking neutrons from the reactor hall towards the guide tube. And on the guide tube, we have few neutron scattering instruments. Among all these instruments, I work on a powder diffractometer called PD3, which is, you can see here. This is the reactor wall. This is a shielding tunnel. The new neutrons come out of here. And here, somewhere here is our sample position. And this is the, diff the diffractometer, there's a detector banks where the detectors are. The and the advantage of on our beamline is that we have something called sample environment, which means that we can use the sample environment for measuring neutron diffraction patterns as a function of temperature, as a function of temperature and magnetic field. So uh, since our focus is mainly on the study of magnetic materials, the structural property correlations, we do neutron diffraction as a function of temperature, we look at the structural properties, how they evolve as a function of temperature, and as well as under the magnetic field. So these are some of the characteristics of this diffractometer, which I can find for this diffractometer. I should also tell you that every neutron diffractometer, whatever you see here or wherever in the world, are customized for that particular place. So we have to customize depending on the area, depending on the space, the diffractometer. So there are several components are involved in the diffractometer. So as you see, this is a schematic of that. We have this tunnel where the neutron beam comes out from the through tube. It falls on a monochromator. So in this case, we are using a sing, sing, uh, silicon single crystal doubly focusing monochromator. What I mean is that it focuses on the horizontal thing as well as in the vertical thing. The, the curved detector or this bent crystal, the advantage is that it works as a momentum transfer, which is like momentum focus. It ha we have about a 90 degree takeoff. For, it's like bending the neutron beam by 90 degrees so that it it is compressed and falls and focused towards the sample. The advantage of, of this particular uh, monochromator is that with a 90 degree takeoff, several and, and by choosing the appropriate plane of reflection for the silicon single crystal, we can change our wavelengths. Why it is important is that since our scattering range is fixed from six degree to 1.3 degree, we, by changing the wavelengths, we can actually go to the lower and lower Q values. So we use 1.48 as our stock wavelength because we get maximum intensity at 1.48, but other wavelengths are also possible by just rotating the sample, by rotating the single crystal in a particular plane, okay, by choosing different reflections. And we can go to the higher reflections also by just inverting this single crystal. We use 1.48 for protein experiments for structure analysis, and we can use the higher wavelength for studying the magnetic structures. That's useful because, as you can see, we can go to the lower Q values. The other components of the diffractometer are, there's a nose cone, which actually helps in focusing the neutron beam towards the sample. This is the sample position, which scatters neutron in all directions. And this is our detector bank, where we have four detector banks, and each detector bank consists of three detectors. So, so in all, we can use four detectors, or 12 detectors at a time. And the entire pattern is recorded in one shot. As I said, we are using some sample environment also, which means that when we use this uh, sample environment, it falls into the neutron beam line. So whatever comes in neutron beam path gets scattered. So we to cut down the contribution from those sample environment, we use this oscillating radial collimator called ORC, which oscillates in the entire two theta range 
to cut out the uh, the uh, the background which comes from the sample environment. So after the background is cut, the, the data from the, the signal from the detector is fed to the data acquisition control system, which controls the experiment and as well as records the data and get the data in intensity versus two theta form, which is further processed for analysis. Okay. Now when we do talk about structure determination, what we generally do is that the, well, we have calculated I intensity, I observed from the diffraction experiments. Now we have to calculate I, the I intensity for our particular sample, which depends on different uh, parameters. As we have seen that a diffraction pattern consists of several information which is buried there, which depends upon the phases like crystal structure, symmetry, uh, cell volume, what is the unit cell parameters, what type of uh, crystal symmetry it has. It also can, depends upon the instrument geometry, what type of radiation we are using, what type of resolution we have, or it is a background and all that. It depends upon the sample position, shape, orientation, like two foot orientation or not. And so many factors are there. So each of these parameters which you see in this equation can be optimized and refined, like we do in technical refinement. But these different quantities can be refined to get the I calculated, which is intensity of the calculated profile. And what we do is that we, mod, we define this model and fit it to our observed data to get the actual information of the structure. The sample is magnetic, we have to include the magnetic part also. I'll just touch upon, touch upon that in a while. So in a part of this uh, intensity calculation equation is this structure factor. The structure factor, as we have seen, comprises of the atomics or neutron nucleus scattering factor or scattering length. It uh, has a temperature factor in them. It takes into account the atomic position, Miller indices, which talks about symmetry and all that. So some little bit of crystallography, little bit of physics is involved to obtain the diffraction pattern from the structural model which we have here. Now, in, if the sample is magnetic and it is in a magnetically ordered state, what happens is that in addition to the neutron scattering, you have what is called magnetic scattering also. In this case, there's a magnetic vector which depends upon the scattering vector of the, the magnetic scattering and the magnetic moment. So the this magnetic scattering will depend upon the moment, how much is the magnetic moment, depending on the strength of the magnetic moment of that magnetic ion and the scattering vector, which tells about the direction or the propagation vector for that magnetic moment. And how it is arranged with respect to the crystallographic cell. Right. So in, in that case, there are many metals which are magnetic in the periodic table. But it is easy for, for us to identify because magnetic moment or magnetic ions are in B block or the F block. So this is a comparison of nuclear and magnetic scattering amplitudes for different uh, atoms or ions. You can see that uh, this is the uh, nuclear scattering amplitude in bonds, and this is the magnetic scattering amplitude. So for certain elements, the neutron the nuclear scattering amplitude is less than the magnetic scattering amplitude. But in certain cases, you can see that the nucleus scattering amplitude dominates the magnetic. Right. So if a sample is magnetic, and you have you can simultaneously distinguish between the magnetic scattering as well as the nucleus scattering. Right. So you can get information about both the phases. As at the same time, you can get information about the magnetic moment, the magnetic ordered state. So now we come to different types of magnetic structures which are possible. So we note that different types of magnetism as from our, uh, which are there in the solid state physics, something called paramagnet. Okay? So by definition, we know that in paramagnets, the spins are randomly oriented. So in those cases, the total strand, uh, scattering cross-section can be written by this equation, which comprises of the mass of the electron charge, neutron magnetic moment, and the form, magnetic form factor. But the, the selection rules for magnetic scattering are that the component of the atomic moment, which is perpendicular to the scattering vector, only contributes to the magnetic scattering. And also the components of the atomic moments that are perpendicular to the nuclear neutron polarization of the neutron moment can cause the spin flip or the spin scattering. So in case of paramagnets, since they are randomly oriented, the magnetic scattering is highly important. There's no order, so there's no diffraction. So what it is, is a diffusing scattering and which forms largely the goes to the background. 
So if you have a mere sample like some lanthanum manganite, manganese becomes magnetic, but lanthanum remains paramagnetic. So there will be no magnetic moment from lanthanum, only from the manganese. So lanthanum contribution will be more to the structural part, whereas manganese will contribute both for the structure as well as the magnetic part. Now we know there are different types of magnetic structures like ferromagnets are the anti-ferromagnets, ferromagnets. And we know that how the profile looks like when you do the magnetic measurements. Right? So a few examples of magnetic structures, how they look like in when you look at the magnetic structure. Okay. So some examples for ferromagnets are that from the, by definition, we know that all the spins are aligned in the magnetically ordered state or in the ferromagnetic state, all the spins are aligned in a particular direction with respect to the magnetic field. So when you do the experiment, magnetization experiments, we know that at a certain point, all the spins align in a certain direction and they tend to saturate a certain value. These are several examples of ferromagnets where we have seen that you have instantaneous moment and then it tends to saturate at a certain field. So in those cases, you have a magnetic moment where a magnet units are where all the spins are aligned in a particular direction. If you look at the diffraction pattern for a ferromagnet, you won't see that new black peaks coming up, but only the existing black peaks, some of the existing black peaks will be in intensities, which means that there's no, the symmetry has not changed. The crystal structure, the unit cell parameters for a crystal structure or the nuclear cell and the magnetic cell are, are same. This has some resemblance, if you look at this pattern, uh, with the ferromagnetic unit cell. We'll come to that in a short while. The second case is the antiferromagnets. So what we know, understand, what we understand from the definition is that the spins are oppositely aligned and they have are of the equal magnitude. So what we see from uh, magnetization measurement is that at a certain ordering temperature, below a certain ordering temperature, when it goes to the antiferromagnetic state, the moment starts decreasing because the moments are anti-parallel now and they tend to cancel out each other. Right? So if you look at the diffraction pattern of an antiferromagnet, you will see that in case, since you want to draw a unit cell, you have to take a spin up to spin up to get the actual net moment, you have to travel with the next cell in all the directions, which means that the symmetry changes in this condition. And when you do the diffraction of that, you find a new magnetic track coming up in the diffraction pattern. Which means that in this case, the, the antiferromagnetic cell is large compared to the, um, the magnetic cell is large compared to the crystallographic cell. So different symmetry. So in this case, the example, the unit cell has actually doubled. There are a few examples of antiferromagnets we have seen. Like in this case, I'm showing some manganites, which shows antiferromagnetic ordering, different temperatures and different. And, and the shapes, if you see, are slightly different. Main reason for the difference in this antiferromagnetic profiles, all are antiferromagnetic, but the difference is mainly because of the type of antiferromagnetic order it is. If you see, there are something called type A antiferromagnetic cells, in which, you see closely, you have a plane in which moments are ordered in a particular fashion. If you consider as a spin up, then in the next plane, you will see that these are all spin down. There is a ferromagnetic order, ferromagnetism along the plane. But the planes are coupled antiferromagnetically. Similarly, there's something called type C antiferromagnets, in which you have this ferromagnetic coupling along a particular direction, which are diagonal. But similarly for this case, but within the plane, there is antiferromagnetic part. The, ne the next neighbor is antiferromagnetic. Then there is something called type E uh, antiferromagnetic structures. In which in a plane, you have one spin which is down, other other spin up, and it's opposite in the other plane. But if you see these planes are net moment is antiferromagnet double. Along like that, you have type G antiferromagnet in, in which the next every next element is oppositely coupled. So antiferromagnetism within the plane and among the planes. And if you go back to charge ordering, there is something called C type ordering, which means you, you cannot detect charge ordering by neutron diffraction. But if you look at the magnetic structures of systems which shows charge ordering. You may see C type order, which is a combination of C type and E type of antiferromagnetic. Then there are several complex magnetic structures also, which are possible in antiferromagnets, like triangular, canted antiferromagnets, umbrella, 
and more complicated ones like sine and cosine structures. You can have something like helix. You can have elliptical cubic structure also. Okay. Now comes the another type of anti-ferromagnetic, which is known as a ferromagnet. What it means is that you have moments which are anti and which are opposite in direction, but the magnitude is also different. So what you see in terms of magnetic measurements is that it has a spontaneous moment, but they are at low temperatures in ordered state, it shows and behaves like an anti -ferromagnet. Moment tends to fall. If you look at the magnetization pro properties as one of field also, looks different from anti-ferromagnets and ferromagnets. It shows spontaneous movement but tends to saturate at a higher field. It doesn't saturate, I'm sorry, at a higher field. It tends to increase with the field. So if you model this, uh, the diffraction patterns, which looks more or less like a uh, ferromagnet, but there are certain differences. But when you model that, you can and you see that there are an, magnetic moments which are coupled anti-parallel but have a different uh, magnitudes. Right. Now coming back to the equation which will define the ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic structures, we come back to the magnetic part of scattered cross-section. So now in this case, when the system is magnetically ordered, ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetically ordered, you have to consider this scattering magnetic interaction wave vector, which we have seen comprises of scattering vector and the magnetic moment, which should be part of the scattering cross-section, differential scattering cross-section. So in those cases, the magnetic scattering length amplitude depends upon the constants plus this, the atomic, uh, uh, the orbital moment as well as the uh, scattering length, okay, the form factor, either it is the magnetic scattering length. Okay. So in case of ray rates, it will be G into J, you consider J in place of S, but in case of transition metal, we'll consider S because the orbital moment is this question. Okay, so now coming back to that, the magnetic scattering interaction vector with nuclear scattering will have a total cross section which comprises of coherent and incoherent parts, nuclear magnetic interaction, magnetic interaction vector, cross section, and polarization. When we talk about elastic diffraction or neutron diffraction experiments, we are talking about we are using the unpolarized field. So these terms can be neglected. So what we consider for neutron unpolarized diffraction using unpolarized neutrons is this differential cross-section, which talks of, which comprises of the scattering length, magnetic interaction vector, and magnetic moment. So coming back to the equation where we are looking at the structure factor, now the structure factor should include the nuclear part and the magnetic part, and our intensity which we calculate should be proportional to the square of this structure factor. Therefore, in the magnetic order state, the intensities are some of the nuclear and the magnetic intensities. So, with this, I will come to some examples which are designed to show, which I have chosen to show the, the, uh, the importance of neutron scattering, the information which came from the neutron diffraction in explaining the physical properties. The first example which I have taken is this Halden uh, spin chain system TP2BN05. Right? In which we're trying to understand the origin of multifluoricity. So before I go to that, there are two terms which I'd like to highlight. One is multifluoricity, another is the Alden spin chain system. What do we mean by multifluoricity is that there is always a challenge of coupling magnetism and photoelectricity in the same compound, in the same phase. Okay. And what we mean by that is that in a sample which has any of these three ferroic properties, that is ferromagnetism, which has now been uh, modernized and we can take both antifero and ferro in this. It has magnetic, it has ferroelectric, or it has to be ferroelectric. Any of these two should be present in a sample and they should be coupling within that. If you take a sample, make a multiferroic, which has both ferroelectric part and the magnetic part, then you end up in a situation where the ferroelectric part can, dom can influence the magnetic part or the magnetic part or magnetization can influence the polarization in the sample. If those both occur simultaneously, then we end up in a situation where we have the sample where both polarization and magnetization exists. All, either polarization exists, or there's no magnetization, or there's no polarization but magnetization, and none of these two exists. So this four state logic will, in a particular multiferroics, make them very interesting for the spintronic materials. 
but unfortunately, there are not many naturally occurring multiple rights. And to understand, and therefore they had to be made artificially. Now, to understand them in a proper way, to classify certain materials which can be multiferic or not, they are classified in two types, like type one and type two multiferics. Type one are the good ferroelectrics, where the uh, critical temperatures are often above the room temperatures, and it has both magnetic and ferroelectric transitions. Both are above room temperatures. It is advantageous because it will give you a multiferroid, which is multiferroid at room temperature. So you don't have to worry about the temperatures. But unfortunately, in these systems, the coupling between the ferroelectric and the magnetic part is very weak, like in case of these uh, examples. There are other types of multiferroids also, where the ferroelectric exists only in the magnetic and ordered state. And this happens because of the certain type of magnetic order. Okay, so mostly in case of cycloid orders, or because of, or because of the magnetic frustration, you can see that, that ferroelectricity comes, like in case of these uh, examples. Now, there have been given several uh, mechanisms which has been proposed to understand this multiferroics. There is something called proper multiferroics, in which the conventional ferroelectric pro pro properties are there in which the symmetry allows the, 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 they are called polar symmetries or polar space groups, which allows the uh, ferroelectricity in these compounds. There are fer ferroelectricity can be due to the lone pairs also, like in bismuth and lead, where, where because of the lone pairs of bismuth and lead, you can have induced ferroelectricity because of breaking of the symmetry, of the inversion symmetry. There, there are something called improper ferroelectricity also, where you can make a hybrid of uh, Ferroelectrics and induced ferroelectricity. Okay. The ferroelectricity can be due to charge or, or orbital order, you create a disorder and you can induce certain type of ferroelectricity in that. There can be magnetism induced ferroelectricity also, which can which is explained. The reason why I'm giving these examples is that in case of tb 2 bno 5 as you can see, the, the origin of ferroelectricity, multiferroelectricity is not clearly understood. Now there comes the spin frustrated system or one dimensional systems like the Halden spin systems, which are very attractive or very interesting because they, they show different magnetic characteristics compared to two or three dimensionally ordered systems. And in one dimensional interferomagnets, you can expect magnetic fluctuations, which can play a very important role. So our interest was to look into systems which is, which is one dimension, which can show magnetic electric coupling. But the origin of this is quite interesting, and that's what we, we are trying to address in this talk. So there were several studies on this uh, Halden-Spingen systems, which shows large magnetic coupling. And, and the interest for this particular example was that we, we observed very large, extraordinarily large intrinsic magnetic coupling in tb 2 b and IL5. If you look at the physical properties of that, it shows that the typical one-dimensional or magnetic strength or ordering in this. But it, if you look at carefully, it, it shows two long-range magnetic order around 65 and around 25. Okay. So and if you look at the, uh, the heat capacity, it shows field dependence also. So does the magnetodielectric effect. If you look at the magnetodielectric coupling it, you, or magnetization as a function of field, you can see that it shows this stuff-like properties which establishes beyond doubt that there is magnetoelectric coupling in this sample. We find a large magnetoelectric electro coupling of about 17 percent in the system. And this was, and the multiferocity is confirmed by this uh, pyroelectric measurements and uh, pyroelectric current measurements, which shows this nice uh, polarization in the sample. But the question is, why does it, show, it should show uh, the Multiferocity, because the conventional wisdom says that IEEM space group, which this system was known, the structure was known, it forms in this IEEM orthorhombic space group. If you look at this, the details of the space group, it is a centrosymmetric space group, which means there's a presence of inversion symmetry, which doesn't allow the formation of dipoles. Okay. So the, by from symmetry, there's no uh, possibility of, of seeing uh, ferroelectricity in this compound. So we try to understand it by looking at the diffraction, extra diffraction as a function of temperature. 
look because of the sensitivity or resolution of X-rays, but trying to see if there is any change in the, the symmetry or change in the structure. We did not find any symmetry or structure change in that. So next thing which we do was to look at the structure and magnetic structure by using neutron diffraction. So neutron diffraction was done as a function of temperature. So in addition to structure, where we did not find any symmetry change, we could look at the magnetic structure and we can see the magnetic structure as a function of temperature. So what interesting fact we find is that if you look at the terbium and nickel moment, they make an angle theta with respect to the C-axis. Okay. So as we go down in temperature, as we go through these two transition temperature, magnetic transition temperature, we find that the below temperature where it shows the ferroelectric onset of ferroelectric transition or the second magnetic order, we find that this spin or the canting angle for theta of theta for terbium and nickel, they change uh, with respect to temperature. If I plot the difference between these two theta, I find that at a certain temperature, it shows the large change. This is the temperature at which we see the onset of electricity. This is the temperature at which the magnetic order sets in. So what we imply from this measurement of this, this study is that this critical angle is very important for the onset of magnetoelectric coupling in this system, which means that the pair of 3D and 4F is responsible for the onset of magnetoelectric coupling. There are not many systems where in which the F moments, the moment, magnetic moment of an F block element like radars, play a role in inducing ferroelectricity. So therefore, this, this sample or this example it throws the question for identifying multiferroics in which the F moments are responsible. There are not many in which the spin orbit coupling mediated polarization is seen. We need to understand that. And this study will also uh, is a step forward in understanding the spin canted cause multiferocity in, in several systems. Okay. Uh, next example, which I would like to show you is the magnetism and the ma understanding of magnetism of, and magnetic structure of Edison RS3. There have been several studies on this isostructural compounds, which are very interesting because they exhibit large magnet resistance and large magnetic properties which was reported. And they have also reported the magnetic structure in which they find that the magnetic structure is spin spiral and things like that. But our interest was on this rhodium based systems, rare earth seven rhodium three systems, where we have observed large magnetic resistance, large magnetic dielectric effects and so on. What we were interested with this particular composition was Edison RS3 was that it shows magnetic phase transition, anomalous magnetic phase transition around 10 Kelvin. And it also exhibit first field induced first order phase transition, which was surprising in a stoichiometric compound, which gives, in which the evidence for kinetic hindrance or phase coexistence was seen from the measurements. What I mean by is that if you look at the magnetization as a function of field, you see that when, this is the first curve, when you apply the magnetic field, at a critical field, it, transforms or this, this is called the field in this first order phase transition. So from an anti phase, it goes to the ferromagnetic phase and remains there. When you cycle the field back, it doesn't come back to its original state, but remains at a higher state, which means that it is still in the magnetized state, that is the high field state. Even if I do this field cycling, it remains in the high field state only. And this takes place as long as we are in the magnetically ordered state. Similar behavior can be seen in the micro resistance measurements also. And also, but one can also rule out this, that there's this glass-like structure or glass-like symmetry but that can be ruled out because you can see the strong peaks in the heat capacity, which shows that there are two strong and long range magnetic orders. Magnetic ordering in this field. What we are clearly observing is that anomalous behavior below this. 10 Kelvin order, below the actually 20 Kelvin order in this system. So how do we understand this anomalies in magnetic behavior? So one way is to look at the magnetic structure, how to add as a function of temperature. So we did neutron diffraction experiments to identify that this crystal structure. So we find that there are three distinct crystallographic uh, sites for neodymium, and all three are magnetic in this case. 
So as you go down the magnetically ordered temperature, you will see that there's an ordering around the Kelvin and one thing, something around 16 Kelvin. So when you do neutron diffraction as a function of temperature without the applying magnetic field, you can see that as you go down in temperature, the magnetic peaks becomes this magnetic peak becomes stronger and stronger. It is maxima around 16 Kelvin, and then it goes down to a minima and then rises again. So this kind of behavior you can see clearly in the zero field state. So when you refine the magnetic structures, or uh, define these diffraction patterns as a function of temperature, what we observe is that at 50 Kelvin, it is in the paramagnetic state. So only the nuclear part or the crystallographic part is observed. But as you go down in temperature, the magnetically ordered state below between the first and second magnetic order, we find only the antiferromagnetic state which is present. But when you go below the second magnetic order, we find that there is a presence of uh, antifero and ferromagnetic phases, which is an evidence for the presence of co coexistence of ferro and antiferromagnetic phases along with the neutron uh, nuclear phases. So this is how the antiferromagnetic structure looks like, and this is the ferromagnetic structure, for this, which are present in the same phase at this temperature. Now, when we say that there's an evidence of kinetic hindrance, so what we mean is that when you magnetize the sample at a low temperature in the magnetic ordered state, it remains in that state for a long time, unless you remove the field and form it above this ordered temperature. So how can you visualize that as a function in a neutron diffraction experiment? So what we did was we focused on this strong antiferromagnetic field and subject it to what is called known as Chuff protopart, which is cooling and heating in unequal fields. So what we measure in magnetization measurements, like doing susceptibility measurement as a, as a function of temperature, by cooling in a certain field and reducing the field and warming it in a different field, we find that you can retain the high field magnetization state for a long time as a function of temperature and field. Right? So there's a kinetic arrest which can be done when you cycle it in a different fields. So this same experiment can be done with neutrons also. So we were focusing on this strong neutron field and we did carry it out measured by neutron diffraction measurements by improving the resolution and by cooling in measuring cooling it in zero field, meshing in zero field and different fields as a function of different temperatures. So what we can summarize from here is that when you, in the magnetically ordered state, when you cool in zero field and warm in zero field, you can go back to your state. There's no arrest in this case. The moment you cool it in high field, a uh, field which is above the critical field, that means in, at this field, it is certainly pushed to the first order phase transition. You can retain that field even if you warm up in different fields. And this retains up to a certain field. So these experiments repeated at different temperatures spanning these three, uh, these three temperatures, which is across these two outer temperatures. But finally, what you can understand from this is that there is a kinetic arrest. And by choosing certain field and temperatures, you can actually leave it to fair or arrest this magnetic phase. This is quite interesting observation which can be done to neutron diffraction. And based on these experiments, we can say that there's a coexistence of antiferromagnetism and ferromagnetism in this compound, which was which was observed in magnetic measurements, but confirmed from neutron diffraction. And it also shows that, that by from Chuff protocol, you can actually see the kinetic arrest, and you can arrest the high field magnetic state. And by using in the field cycling, you can actually uh, de-arrest that phase also. So this is a unique compound which has been studied from neutron diffraction, which shows that this is a, in a stoichiometric compound, you can have first order phase transitions also, and you can have uh, phase coexistence. And briefly, I would like to show the, the final example in which we have studied the series of compounds by using neutron diffraction. So when you're replacing manganese with iron in this case, you can see, and if you measure the diffraction pattern, you can see that new practice start appearing at a certain concentration of iron. What does it mean? Okay, so because at, if you look at the magnetic measurements at room temperature, it shows magnetism at room temperature. But if you take a LCMO, which is not magnetic at room temperature, so what it could be? Because if there is an impurity, it can give rise to some incorrect, incorrect interpretation of structure as well as the physical properties. 
So in a deep, and also the problem with X-rays is that it cannot detect the magnetic phase. So what you do is that you do X-rays and compare it with neutrons. And when I, obviously we know the difference because of the form factor, but it can also be presence of uh, uh, multiple phases which were not detected by X-rays because of the form factors, or it can be a magnetic phase or it can be a combination of form. So when I uh, subject it to a refinement using the same structural model, you see that most of the peaks match when the structure is same, but the problem is that you can see that certain peaks are not matching. So if I can rule out any, because all Bragg peaks are, are accounted for, I can say that there's no secondary phase, but this has to be the magnetic phase, which is confirmed by, by the magnetic measurements also. So when I add the magnetic phase and refine the structure, I'm able to account for all the phases and all, almost all the intensities. So if I look at this magnetic structure, I, I know that this, I can, and compare it with magnetization, I can understand that this is a canton and flow structure. So I can, and again, when you do a systematic study for the entire sample for different concentration, you can look at the structural changes which takes place. And if the sample becomes magnetic, you can actually find out information about the magnetic moments also as a function of temperature. So to summarize this part, I can say that the Newton diffraction clearly establishes that LCFO was magnetic at room temperature. There's no impurity in that. And the information obtained from neutron complements the information which we get from the excited measurements. And you can also look at the spin structure and magnetic moments of FA iron in this case. So I can summarize my or conclude my talk by summarizing these points that neutron diffraction is complemented to X-ray and electron. You get additional information with, in addition to what you get from X-ray and electron. Neutron is, diffraction is a powerful technique for study of crystallographic structures as well as magnetic structures. It helps in establishing with structural property relations. If you understand the structural properties, you can correlate it with, with physical properties which will help in designing new materials and characterize them thoroughly, and which will help in advancing the research in the field of material science and principle. With that, for the benefit of the students, these are some of the references, and which I think will, be help, will help you in understanding diffraction, a neutron diffraction, and quad diffraction in particular, literal analysis and all that. With that, I would like to, to thank you all. Thank you very much. And I, I hand it back to you to Chintan. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for this presentation. Now we move towards the question and answer part. Uh, those who have questions may just raise their hand. Yes. Uh, we take the first question from Iman Chu Okay. Hello. Good yeah. morning, sir. Hello. Good morning. Thank you very much, sir, for this much uh, this information. I want to know uh, what parameters and what things should be kept in mind while preparing the samples for neutron diffraction. Yeah, one first thing is that, as I said, that not all elements are neutron friendly. There are neutron absorbers also. So you should look into the, if you are preparing certain compound, you look into the ingredients of that and try to find out the absorption cross section. The scattering cross-section has to be more than the absorption cross-section to get a meaningful neutron diffraction data. That is the first part. And compared to X-ray diffraction, you need more amount of sample for neutron because it's so, it is a slow process. So if you are using any rare earth metals or very expensive metals, you have to be careful because you have to prepare uh, large quantities, about three to four grams of neutron samples for neutron diffraction. So that is something which you have to keep in mind for doing neutron diffraction. And again, you have to look for the cost to uh, benefit also, because if you can you are sure that you will get more information from neutron than from excess, then definitely you should look into the neutron diffraction. And is a neutron diffraction possible for thin films? Not diffraction. What information you can get from thin films is from the reflectometry measurements. You can look into the interfaces, you can look into the uh, magnetic moment of a thin film. If you're working with the heterostructures, you can get the magnetic moment for different layers by using polarized neutron reflectometry. So in, in Dhruva, there's one reflectometer which works right now at 
is at room temperature, but maybe they are going to add low temperature benefits for that. But again, the requirement is that you should have a slightly bigger thin film, like one inch by one inch uh, uh, size of thin film. And if your flux is high, uh, like in sources abroad, you can maybe work with one centimeter square thin films. Yeah. But you will not get the structural information. You get the information about the inf interfaces, roughness of interfaces. You can get the magnetic moment of the films. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. We take the next question from uh, Divya Raj. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, hi, Divya Raj. Hi. Uh, sir, I was wondering if uh, you could tell me, in order to determine the crystalline structure, yeah. the neutron irradiation which we do for diffracting, so what type of uh, neutron uh, irradiation has to be has it to be means uh, thermal neutrons or slow neutrons or fast neutrons how does yeah first thing is that we are not irradiating the sample we are actually using it in the transmission mode so there's no interaction of neutrons with the sample other than that it gets diffracted from the sample uh, we are using thermal neutrons because the if you convert the energy of thermal neutrons in term, and write it in terms of wavelength it will be of the order of one to five angstroms right so that is very com comfortable and it's compatible with our X-ray wavelengths also. So it is very convenient to do diffraction with thermal neutrons. Okay, okay. Yeah. If we take the next question from Amarendra Kumar. Yeah. Yes, you can ask. Yeah. Okay, we take the next question. We move yeah. on to the next question from Anirudh Singh. Yeah. Sure. So, good afternoon, sir. I am Anirudh Singh from Aspires Physics in Jivaji University. Yeah, hi. Hey. Uh, my question is, uh, could neutron diffraction at small angles be used to uh, study uh, radial dimensions of RNA or DNA of uh, small isometric viruses or protein shells for treating yeah. viruses? Yes, yes, that is true. For, uh, for uh, large polymer structures like viruses or protein structures, people uh, or liquids, people uh, do small angle neutron scattering experiments. Uh, so is so yeah. is there any limit? Is there any limit for doing? Uh, which limit you are saying? Uh, sir, actually, uh, what kind, What is the minimum limit for detecting such structures? Uh, if I understand, if the limits are are on the instrument, that means that the Q range of the which of the measurement are determined by the instrument. That this is an instrument characteristic. The sensitivity of the instrument will depend upon the flux which you are getting on the sample for that instrument. And uh, the solubility limit or the concentration limit will be determined by what you're trying to study. Okay. So how much concentration will be there? People study as a function of contrast using water and heavy water to study certain aspects of micelles and uh, polymers and things like that. So the solubility limit will be determined by what you're trying to study. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope I answered your question. We, we move towards the next question from Mukesh Chawda. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mukesh, please. Sir, I have a couple of questions. Uh, can we determine or can we have the information of spin glass transition or long range ordering like RKK by interaction from neutron diffraction? And uh, the second is can we know the cluster size below? Uh, 100 angstrom through neutron diffraction of a magnetic element. Yeah, I, uh, there are two things. One is that uh, what you measure in neutron diffraction, whether it is structure or magnetic structure, is that you are looking at the long range magnetic order. Right? Only if it is long range order, you will detect in neutrons for magnetic interaction also. Whether it is RKK by or otherwise, you have to compare it with your magnetic structure and compare magnetic structure with your magnetization. 
right? So that will tell you whether it is uh, RKK by or whatever. But what it will detect is that it is a magnetic structure. There's a long range order. You can look into the ordered structure and you can model it so that the moments and the, uh, the spin structure which you uh, get should comply with your magnetization measurements. So they are actually, in a sense, complementary to each other, right? Coming to the spin glass part, since it is not an ordered structure, what we'll see in diffraction pattern is a hump kind of thing because it's a disordered structure. You get as a part of your background. For magnetic structures, for if it is a spin glass or a cluster glass, if you get a hump, you can estimate the correlation length from the position of that hump. Okay. You cannot model that and you can you can get some interaction lengths from that. But it is difficult to look, look into the structure when, when you have a hump without any long range order in that. And what about the cluster size, which can reach a yes. minimum cluster size, which can be detected through neutron diffraction? Uh, size will depend upon the kind of hump you get. So from that, uh, you can get an estimation of a correlation then. But few nanometers, like 10 to 20 nanometers to 100 nanometers, it depends how much you are able to detect. Right? If it is a part of the background, if you're not able to detect that, you'll not be able to see this. Right? And the uh, spin glass or not, it depends upon the kind of magnetic interaction you have. The neutrons can detect up to 0.5 uh, core magnetrons, not less than that. So that's sure. Sir, I want to know, um, well, I'm not aware uh, aware about zero field cold and field cold. I want to study about it or I want to know the details about it. Which book you will refer for it? Uh, from where get I can, get, can I get the information about it? Oh, the best thing is to... ZFC and FC. Yeah, yeah. one is the, uh, the book from by quality on magnetism. But you can read many literature papers or review articles where they talk about the effects of field cooling and zero field cooling and how it affects the magnetization. So there are many differences, many uh, books, uh, mainly by, so one, one of the interesting books comes to my mind is uh, the magnetism by quality. Yeah. Sure. Yes, sir. And uh, we take the last question from the chat box. Yeah. Uh, someone is asking that uh, in spite of uh, having so much advantage uh, of neutron diffraction, why it is not such a frequent as uh, XRD? Yeah, the one uh, question is that availability. Okay, the neutron sources are very limited. Of course, there are plenty of sources, but compared to X-rays, the availability of neutron sources are less. So X-rays are probably in, in your next laboratory itself, whereas neutrons you have to go to, uh, to a particular place. In India, right now, there is only one source, that's a Thuva reactor you can do neutron diffraction experiments. There are a few sources abroad, but the neutron being very expensive measurement, very expensive technique. So you have to have very strong reason to do neutron diffraction. Right? So when you, have, when you make a, a PAKA case for neutron diffraction, you'll we'll definitely get a good time and you can do that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions and clearing the doubts. Now we move to the end of this lecture and for I the, yeah. Yeah, I can stop the share. Yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah. before ending, I would like to invite one of our PhD scholar in Department of Physics, Kush Vachani, to present the vote of thanks to our today's speaker. Okay. Uh, good noon to one and all pleasure, uh, present here. And uh, it gives an uh, immense pleasure to deliver vote of thanks uh, on this amazing webinar. Uh, yatra to all the dignitaries assembled here and uh, I, Kuswa Chani, uh, uh, on the behalf of Department of Physics, Saurash University, uh, 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 Department of uh, Science and Technology, Government of Gujarat, GST, Gujkost, and Essence Tech, I am uh, very heartily thankful to uh, Dr. Uh, Sudhindra Raiprol uh, for giving such an informative talk. And uh, sir, started from the broad title, understanding uh, understanding structure and magnetism by using the neutron powder diffraction. And then sir, beautifully explained the uh, what is the diffraction and basics of the diffraction with the help of two allotropes of the carbon and uh, different, uh, different probes uh, or uh, methods of, of the diffraction and pros and cons of these uh, methods. And neutron diffraction is... Uh, excellent tool to study the crystallographic properties and uh, classification of the uh, neutrons. 
and uh, various properties of the neutrons and uh, uh, basic theory of the neutron diffraction and then many formulas by one can understand how the neutron diffraction works and uh, uh, basic theory of neutron diffraction and uh, then understanding of the diffraction pattern and recording how to record the diffraction pattern and uh, how to understand these diffraction patterns and uh, uh, how one can choose the radiation source and uh, different types of neutron sources and uh, type of detectors and uh, sir uh, also mentioned some institute where you can perform this uh, this type of measurement and uh, then sir told about the some multiferroics and example of uh, uh, work example of uh, uh, group works and uh, make, uh, then after uh, then after sir discussed the magnetism in a multiferroics and uh, so such an uh, such an wonderful lecture and uh, i would also like to uh, i would also like to thank uh, thank uh, to our vice chan uh, our vice chancellor of saurash university dr nitin pethani sir pro vice chancellor dr vijay desani sir dean faculty of uh, uh, science uh, dean faculty of science uh, dr mehul rupani sir head of department uh, dr mihir professor mihir joshi sir and uh, former head uh, uh, professor hiran joshi sir and uh, uh, doc, uh, professor nikesh sir uh, dr narottam sahu sir uh, who is advisor at uh, buj coast and uh, dr piyush solanki sir and mr chintan panchasra uh, for organizing such an informative and fruitful event on this type of digital platform and also i am also thankful to uh, all the party uh, participants uh, uh, who is present here over to you chintan sir thank you kush uh, at this end uh, as kush said sir we would we would like to once again thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, we once again thank you from behalf of all the organizers thank, thank you, you all we 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 end this session here and tomorrow once again we will meet on the same time and on the same platform thank you all and have a good day thank you very much thank you take care and have a nice day bye 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 sir Bye thank you very much bye thank you